Welcome to Premium Cashflow Real Estate Investing Podcast with Sakar Kali. During this program, you will hear guest experts sharing their experiences, best practices, and market insights. We discuss investing in multifamily apartment complexes and how a busy professional can passively invest hassle-free in various opportunities. Your host, Sakar Kali, owns millions of dollars of assets and has done thousands of value-add projects over 20 years now. So listen in for insights. Here's your host, Sakar Kali. Welcome to another edition of Premium Cashflow Podcast. I'm Sakar Kauli, and with me, I have the pleasure of having Jason Yarusi uh, today. Welcome to the show, Jason. Thanks for having me. How are you? Uh, very good, very good. Thank you. So Jason is with Yarusi Holdings. Uh, that's their parent company. And within that, they have a construction business, a family construction business. Uh, their company, Oak Capital Partners, handles the multifamily uh, division. They own uh, multifamily properties in several states, uh, Texas, Alabama, Indiana, Kentucky, and they're well close to 450 units. And uh, we're gonna dig into his story and learn more about him. So welcome to the show, Jason. <laughs> Great, happy to be here, excited. Awesome, so uh, give us some background, Jason, as to how you got started. Um, and I know uh, your wife, uh, Pili, as well, uh, is instrumental uh, in your support as well. So give us a collective background if you can. Sure, so we started investing in real estate uh, a little over five years ago. Uh, we have a family construction business, goes back five generations. Uh, my father's heavy construction business is uh, back about 45, 46 years now. Handle predominantly uh, very intensive projects, mainly flood zone projects where we'll take houses that have been flooded uh, or some other foundation issues and we'll raise them or elevate the structure to either fix the foundation or, or raise them to new heights to meet theme requirements and town requirements. It's been, of course, heavily predicated on Hurricane Sandy, which happened a number of years ago, and that's uh, occurred in a number of towns here in New Jersey to implement rules. Um, and so that work's been, been hot and heavy, to say the least. So we've been doing that work, and along that process, it just occurred to us that we had to find a solution to, to offer some kind of passivity to our lives because with any service business, restaurant, you know, bar or anything, if you're not actively open or doing something, you're not making money. And the same thing is, goes with construction. If we weren't doing these heavy construction projects, um, you know, or get very cold weather or just massive, there's some other point here where we couldn't operate. Well, we don't have income coming in. And noting this, we started flipping houses, thought that was the viable way, and that just becomes another job. You have an, uh, basically an asset that doesn't produce income until you actually put it back online and sell it. So for us, we kept looking at different models and it went from flipping houses, we did some Airbnbs, some small rentals here and in the Midwest. And the rentals did so well for us, but they were so small, two and three families, and we were just seeing them cash flow. But again, you know, it's cash flowing on such a small level that, okay, what are we going to do? Buy, buy 100 of these and try and do this on this scale. And then when you have a two family and you have one vacancy, now you're 50% occupied. Or if a roof goes, it's on two units. So it just occurred to me, if these are doing so well, well, what would it take to scale this? And I, and I saw other people doing large multifamily. And I really set my mind on that and dove all into that process of what would it take to scale up to a 50 units, a hundred units or beyond? And what would that process look like? And just started finding like-minded people, found their process. And that led us to our first acquisition in the middle of uh, May, 2017, which was a 94 unit apartment complex in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. That's awesome. That's awesome. And there are several points in, in that, uh, Jason, is that, one is you have a extremely thorough family business background of construction, which in my opinion is extremely uh, beneficial for anybody starting out is that you got to know something uh, around real estate. And especially I'm a big fan that uh, if you've done some rentals or some uh, home improvement type of things around let's say your own house or any like small rental property that you may own, that gives you a good segue or understanding of what it takes to deal with contractors, understand exterior interior renovations, because sometimes you can get into these multifamily deals and not understand that, oh geez, this, 
the scale of these projects can be so big that, and more importantly, actually, they can be so costly that if you underestimate uh, sort of your value add budget and things like that, that, that can be extremely uh, difficult to, uh, you know, uh, sort of overcome in that. Would you agree? Absolutely, right? And so it goes two points, right? I, I feel investing out of state for us was important because the knowledge is good, but we were very active. So if I was investing here in large multifamily in New Jersey, I'd probably get in the way trying to do some of the work ourselves or trying to, you know, act as some of the, some of the property management. So for sure. us to know this, we know the process out of state where it comes in line. And what's important to note is that you just, like you said, these are large projects right. and people usually do not anticipate the, the time it's going to take to actually do this work especially sure. if you're operating around, you know, tenants and leases and everything else and right. to the cost performing, you know, and generally you're, you're right. There's different kinds of contractors. There's generally, there, there's a rare combination where people are good at business and good at the work as a contractor, but generally right. you have people that are good at the business or good at the work and usually not in between. So if you're not watching the contractor and making sure that they're providing you with a proper budget, well, okay, what is this budget actually entailing? Are they just giving me, you know, part of the work? Do I have a quote here that's, that's full encompassing, but they've left out sheetrock. And if you don't know to look for that and you don't go back to them and say, Hey guys, you're missing sheetrock just to find out, Oh, we don't do that. But they're telling you, they're giving you a, you know, a, a full GC turn, turn, uh, keep quote, but just missing that little point there. Well, there's another, you know, $2,200 per unit or some of, something of that magnitude. So it does help understanding the items, understanding how to have that talk track with the contractors and really having that time process. So you can set expectations where if I'm going to turn this complex around, well, what is that going to look like? Am I going to be able to do these renovations in three months, six months, 18 months? And how's that going to look like from a performance uh, perspective? Very well said. Very well said. I couldn't agree more. It's, it's just attention to those details and making sure, you know, the units are properly ready and things like that, that, that gets you, you know, like, for example, in, in, in our market here, where we have over like a couple of hundred rentals, uh, basically, and we, we've done like so many class A renovations that we have this down to a system that from roof to kitchens, to basements, to bathrooms, and we have it down to the pad where we don't have those issues. And the only reason we were able to be in that position is, I think, only because doing the quality work. And as you rightfully said, is that if you have turnovers or a lot of maintenance issues, they are, they are typically due to you know, lower quality of work. And of, of course, when people move out, you have that uh, sort of a, a pretty much your 100% vacant, which is the fact. And it, it all comes down to having good work, good management, and having the scale so that, uh, you know, even if a couple of units are uh, experiencing turnover, it doesn't, you know, rock your boat that much, you know. So awesome. So uh, Jason, uh, tell us like how uh, was your first deal? Like how it came about? Uh, was it like, you know, how you, you were able to, you know, collect the equity and how did you syndicate about it? Sure. So in the 94 unit, we actually had found this deal about eight months prior before closing, um, was brought to us by a connection we made there with the property manager. They knew these uh, owners were looking to sell because the, uh, the father who was in his 90s had passed away and left it to the kids who were in their 60s and 50s. We'll call them kids. Well, the kids were all out of state and wanted nothing really to do with the property. Mm -hmm. um, they had a big single family rental portfolio and with this one large multifamily property. And they thought that it'd be easier to keep all the single family. Uh, maybe could just cause they were more familiar with that. They thought that was safer than just this large complex. And they were letting this large complex. It was the bones were really good, but just the operations were very poor. They had too much maintenance. They weren't watching the, the numbers. They had a, a leasing person who really wasn't on the ball. Uh, mm -hmm. And so they had a price in mind and um, it was 3.2 million. And just based on the, the, the numbers, we offered two, 2.1 million, very far apart. Um, they came back and said, nope, 3.2 million is where we are. And we said, okay, thank you. And, and went away. And uh, another, I guess maybe it was six months later, still out there, still kicking around, nothing had happened. So sure. we just went back to them and said, Hey, we, we know you're still out there. Um, we can bring our offer up $50,000. So now we're at uh, 2.1 million and 50,000 mm -hmm. and their $3.2 million uh, asking price now cut down to 2.6 million. Mm -hmm. So we had a $600,000 drop in price mm -hmm. just because now I think they were more 
they, their price alignment was, was now more guided based on what the market was telling them. So we knew we had that start and uh, another month, month and a half of negotiations back and forth. We got to the finish line uh, at 2.3 million, which was a great number for where we felt we were in the market, uh, about 24 and a half a door. Uh, and for that, we really just hit the, hit the ground running and we had, we did syndicate the deal. Uh, which was we are acting as a general partners. We basically handle the operation of the property, you know, finding the deal, uh, sourcing the deal, putting together the underwriting, uh, finding the lending partners, finding all of our insurance partners. And then we brought on limited partners uh, to basically help pay for the down payment, the closing costs, the uh, fees, and any of the capital expenditures. We do a preferred return. Uh, and sure. we couple that with a split to the investors, a 70-30 split where the limited partners get 70% of any of the cash flow after they are, hit that preferred return. Sure. And then we get 30%. So once we closed on the deal, we, we did have a lot of opportunity to really just go after a lot of just the, the low-hanging fruit, uh, fruit, right? So put on the right maintenance staff, cleaned up a lot of just the, the, the maintenance items that were outstanding for tenants, maintenance issues, put in proper leasing. We were able to lease up units very quickly. We were also way under market. If you have the same garden style building that was right across the street, you mm -hmm. could literally just walk right across the street, same style building managed by somebody else and you would pay a hundred dollars uh, more a door. Our property was, uh, was at a 91% um, occupancy compared to that building where you're paying a hundred dollars more where they were at 97 percent solely because the, the yeah. leasing person was just not doing her job she was so busy when we came in to do our inspection that she was watching dog the bounty hunter and didn't want to answer our questions and <laughs> just wasn't picking up the phone and she had seven vacant units of which six were actually rent ready to go rent and right. she wasn't picking up the phone to rent them she, she was, was comfortable <laughs> she was comfortable, way comfortable. So she did not make it past uh, past closing day. And with that, it was so easy that we could just get these online, put in uh, pr proper processes, mm -hmm. do proper application processes, and now start putting the process into work. So we had that. Uh, we had a good amount of CapEx that we had to take care of that were just outstanding uh, from the Linda repairs and also our choice of repairs. And we were able to knock out that all within, we did 35 turns and the complete um, basically repair list over five month uh, course right there. Um, we did do have a Fannie seven, six arm loan mm -hmm. allowed us to roll some of the CapEx into the loan and it mm -hmm. did have a one year blackout period. So we were able to take it. We were, we were basically improved by month five, complete, continue to stabilize the property throughout the rest of the year. And then in mm -hmm. month 13, we were able to refinance the property into a Freddie uh, um, ten-year term loan and pull out a bunch of cap or cash and give the cash back to investors. And in a part of about seventy-five percent of their equity was returned after one year. Oh, awesome, awesome! So you were able to kind of almost go through the cycle pretty, you know, pretty short amount of time, actually. Correct. Yeah, we, we had a very nice price point for where we brought. It was the lowest uh, purchase uh, in a number of years in that sub market. Uh, but again, it was just on the operations. They were they were not performing well, and they saw it as a thorn where we saw it as an opportunity. So tenants are happy. We've cleaned up the property. We, we've made it really nice and really great place for them. We've put in a lot of things like uh, moving fees or referral fees, and we're, we're it's happy to say that one of three, three new uh, tenants that come in now come through our referral program from other tenants, which... If you look at it from a point of a, a leasing standpoint, you, of course, your two biggest costs are turning units and sure. being vacant, right? So Absolutely. now if I can have a friend refer another friend, a good tenant who we've had now gone through our right application process, refer another tenant to come in there, that yeah. helps me to cut down on my time vacant. It also helps me bring in a good tenant. And generally, when people are living with their friends, they're going to stay longer. So instead of me having you know, a year, maybe I get a couple of years out of these people staying in this, in this building, and now I'm cutting down on my turn costs as well. That, that's absolutely true. And it, it's, it's well worth to offer that um, a referral bonus to the uh, tenants and help them fill the vacancies much quicker, you know, couldn't right. agree more. Um, so uh, in there, I think, uh, uh, Jason, there were several things that we can uh, hone in, right? So about how do you uh, choose the market? Like what were uh, sort of the motivating factors uh, for you to, you know, gravitate towards that? And also if you could describe like you, re it sounds like right at the uh, get go, you replaced your property management, right? So there's a lot to say about uh, what to look for, how to analyze property ma uh, management, especially, you know, when you're doing this in out of state, could you maybe walk us through that progression as to, you know, 
how you went about your market selection, uh, chose this particular opportunity, and then went up, uh, you know, and close uh, and chose a different property manager. Sure. Yes. Yeah. So market wise, we're looking for MSAs that have 250,000 people or more. We just want to make sure that if we have a building that our building is not going to be just if there's 3000 people in the town and I got a 94 unit building, well, my building is now making up. I'm going to need a lot of those people to live in my building. So I want to make sure there's right. enough people in the area that can suffice to cover our buildings. Sure. Also make sure there's a lot of types of buildings that actually work for our points. If I'm looking for a hundred unit apartment complexes in Provo, Utah, there's like three apartment complexes that are over a hundred units. So it's probably not not going to be a viable area for me to look for properties. Right. Then I'm going to focus on the metrics, population growth, uh, job growth, and job diversity, all which are important. So uh, is the population stagnant? Has it been on decline for a number of years? Are people more moving out? Well, that's probably not going to be an area we want to focus on. And yeah. past that, jobs. We're going to look for jobs and that the jobs are actually performing jobs, right? So it's not something where it's, it's a third tier job where it's going to be hard for people to make rent and then that the jobs are diverse. So we take a Louisville, Kentucky. It's got moderate population growth, you know, ho-hum, 3%, nothing to see here, but it's definitely still moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. uh, job growth and then the jobs are diverse. They have UPS FedEx, uh, um, GE, it's got Churchill Downs, it's got Humana, it's got University of Louisville. Like, there's just so many different reasons that if, if one of these employers for some reason backed out, went somewhere else, it wouldn't hurt the job pool because there's a number of different employers to pull for. Uh, another good one to look at, of course, and that this comes down to submarkets, is looking at the construction coming online. Am I going to be buying a property and that's going to be faced with another 3,000 units coming online right down the block from me when on average, you know, I've only had 2,000 people move into this area over the last three years. Well, what's mm -hmm. that going to look like from my perspective and how are those concessions going to hurt my properties? Um, mm -hmm. so, so those are some of the high level metrics we'll look at just from a market, just to make sure we want to go into that market and then we'll dive further into the specific sub markets. Cause we, we don't operate across a whole city. We will sure. just focus on certain parts of the city that are going to fill more of the blue collar working class area because that's where our, our renter pool really is. Right, right. And speaking of those specific sub markets, Jason, uh, please give us an overview. Like, how would you go uh, and you know sort of drill into that specific sub market? Whether you know, hey, you pick a broad market and then you know you slice and dice it, saying that hey, I'm, I want to be focused on this Northwest section and not go too much into the Southeast side where, you know, there may be some crime and things like that. Would you maybe give us some specific tools uh, or websites and things of that nature as to how you go about uh, uh, finding these? Yeah, you can. I, so simply, if you want to keep it on, on a free level here, go on Google Maps, you can put income layers on there. It can show you the different income levels for that parts of town. Then sure. you can go on Zillow and look at the cost now for where the housing market is, because you want to make sure that for your renter pool that, you know, generally a third of your income is going to go to, to your mortgage or rent. So if I'm in a place where the houses are $200,000 and rent is about $600, um, well, then it's going to be a hard jump for those people to be able to jump into a mortgage. So I'm going to have a better renter pool. But conversely, if I have $700 rents and I have a bunch of houses that are $30,000, that, that generally tends to people have the opportunity to move into a different area here where it's going to be better for them to be able to jump into a, a loan if they had that opportunity. But And also those lower price homes can subject to more quote unquote I don't know, danger or violence, right? Because you get lower mm -hmm. price homes or more right. of that. Then you're gonna, you can look at true your crime maps and the FEMA, FEMA maps to see if you're falling into some dire, dire zone that may be a flood zone. And also the crime maps can give you a good indication of where you are in terms of it. And that goes to a threshold, right? Yeah, sure. yeah, of course, you're probably not okay with murder, but you may be okay, you know, there, there might be, you have a large apartment complex, two, 200, uh, you know, there may be some marital dis, uh, dispute at some time to time with 200 people sure. living in the building. So you may be okay with that. And then lastly, look at schools. You can look at, um, you know, and city data and schools can tell you kind of how is the school system there? Are we into sure. a point where the schools are very poor and if people or families are probably not going to live here because they're going to have to ship their kids somewhere else where they maybe can't afford it for the school systems to be able to go there? Right, right. You're, you're very correct. I think schools is a very significant driver for young families to, uh, you know, sort of analyze where they will live. I mean, some, sometimes they're willing to drive 15, 20 minutes more to their respective jobs, given the schools in that sub market are great. So that 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 is excellent there. And speaking of property management, uh, uh, there, Jason, like 
um, what was your process like what uh, like how many companies you had to interview to get to the specific company that you, you were comfortable with could you maybe give us an overview like how yeah. you went about what questions you had asked and things like that There's probably about 10 companies and they all kind of tiered us to this one company because this company was basically what we were asking for Mm -hmm. We're looking for a company that handles BC assets that had a number of large complexes, a hundred units or more under, under management, uh, had about five to 10,000 units under management. Cause we didn't want to buy a hundred unit building for a property manager that only had 40 single family homes or something right. else. Now they have to ramp up and hire a bunch of people for us. Right. Conversely with that, we also didn't want a property manager that had a focus outside of multifamily. If they were focused on single family homes, it wasn't for us. If they were focused on class A, it wasn't for us. We wanted right. someone who was just into that field of multifamily class C, class B assets. We also wanted them to handle construction in house. Um, of course they still sub out the trades, you know, HVAC boilers, et cetera, but we wanted them to have uh, construction in house. So I wasn't having to have, you know, 10 bids every time I needed to have a sink fix. Mm -hmm. And uh, with that real time data, we, we want them to have property software, property management software, where if I want to, you know, log in at you know, Sunday at seven o'clock and want to see what my collections are or what my uh, vacancy trends are, or if I have anything of that line, well, then I wanted to have that access. And then lastly, on the small component, uh, we do use government assistance for 15% or less. Our, our threshold is 15% um, for our units. So we want to mm -hmm. make sure fluent with that process because if you are not fluent with Section 8 or some of the other government housing uh, projects, it can be um, quite overwhelming for a property manager to, to take on that role. So those were the levels that really from a high point we, we'd go after. Um, and then once we found the right one, then we'd start installing our systems with them to just be most beneficial for our, our properties. Right. And, and choosing that property management company, Jason, like, uh, was that like the interview process? You did all that remotely, like you were calling or you, you took some uh, references from brokers or lenders. How did that come about? Uh, a mix of everything, right? So we would speak to as many people as we could, get references and get introductions, and, uh, but it all was done remotely before we would go out there um, and start talking with them. So we, but we built out our team before we were offering on properties, right? So we were building this team of brokers, of insurance people, of, uh, of contractors, of property managers, of, uh, and also of investors before sure. we were offering on properties because we wanted to make sure that we, we had the full package to implement and we weren't stuck finding a property and say, we got this great deal, but we don't know the rest of the parts. You know? <laughs> now we gotta go figure everything out and because there's just, there's not enough time. I agree. I mean, once you have the property under contract, you better know who your insurance agent is. You better know where the capital is coming from. You should know like who's going to manage and things like that. And you very rightfully said that as far as the property management company goes, you want the right fit for that right uh, style of property. You don't want like, you know, somebody who's like really in suit and tie walking around in this uh, BNC yep. garden style properties. You know, it's a very different culture. So I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, now, speaking of your team of investors, uh, Jason, uh, how did you go about like raising the capital? Because uh, as you know, that it's always a chicken and egg problem that should I run for the deal first or should I go meet my investors and try to, uh, you know, line up the capital first? Like, could you maybe give us a, a sort of a under the hood, uh, you know, overview on how, how you went about that? You know, it's, I was just talking to one of our students who just is now building out his processes. It's like the chicken before the egg, right? Do I, do I raise money for a property I don't have or do I get a property and try to raise the money? We are fully in, engaged that you need to start building your network with, of investors way before you're finding the property. Because Absolutely. if you are, especially if you're new to multifamily, they have to get over the hurdle of being used to you doing this, right? So, um, you know, Jason has a construction company, all of a sudden he's buying apartment buildings. Well, now I have to get over that mental hurdle of, of understanding Jason doing this role. And then second to that, just understand the type of investment because not every investor has invested in real estate, let alone apartment buildings. Maybe they've done bonds, stock market, you know, mutual funds, any of those, you know, crypto, who knows, but they right. may have not done apartment buildings. So now they got to get used to me. They have to get used to the philosophy of, of, of investing in apartment buildings. And then if I was trying to now pitch you a deal all at the same time, that, that's almost too much for people to just comprehend. So generally we'd have the conversation, make them understand why we're doing it and, and the work we're doing and the type of deals we're looking for by creating a mock deal. And that mock deal mm -hmm. basically represented what we were going after. And right. that helped us to find people that, that were really you know, interested in the type of investments that we were going to be finding. 
And it just helped us to have a, a warm intro. So then, you know, six, seven months later, when I find that property, I go back and hey guys, you know, we talked about this investment, you know, you talked about being interested. Well, here we go. Here's the, the real investment. So I just pull out the mock deal and just put in the real investment of what we were going after here. And it made it a lot easier to raise the money for each opportunity we've done. I agree with you. I think having in uh, passive investors convinced that how this works, I mean, personally for us, it took us like maybe two or three uh, different levels of uh, engagements where you go and explain how it works and more importantly, why it works uh, has been extremely instrumental that, you know, you want to explain them that, yeah, you know, like apartments, for example, would be like almost the base level that where somebody, everybody has to have a roof over their head and how the cash flow metrics work and things like that. So I, I totally agree with you there. So uh, and now speaking of uh, value add strategies and different things that uh, uh, that happen in this uh, class B and class C properties, uh, what is your take on them? Like, like what sort of improvements you're doing or what are some of your favorites that you have recently implemented? Sure. So it goes on two levels, right? Generally, we get in there because everybody always focuses on the rent increases, but we like to go in there and make the property perform better so people can understand because our philosophy is to keep it stabilized and not have a huge dip in occupancy so we can maintain and meet our investors' return from quarter one. And that's always been our philosophy. So we'll go in there, clean up the property, whether we got to stripe the parking lot, deal with any concrete flat work, start taking care of all the maintenance issues that have been outstanding and didn't happen before, start taking care of the common areas just to make tenants understand that we're going to take care of this property and it could be rebranding too and make this a better place for them to live. Mm -hmm. Once we do that, then we'll start implementing some of our, our strategies. It may be, you know, pushing utilities back on tenants. Uh, it might be implementing moving fees uh, for new tenants moving in. It might be now adding on do pet fees, which may be missing, uh, but some of the comps support it. And we start putting these strategies in place. There's a lot of different income levels that come in that one um, can help us add up the income without ever raising rents. We'll couple this with some kind of green strategy, uh, possibly we will usually change out all the toilets and change out the faucets uh, all for aerators and low E flush toilets and cut down our water bill because generally the aged properties tend to have master meter property and that cutting that water bill um, we did have the, the property I spoke about before we cut that water bill by 30% and that 30% wow. based on based on the cap rate that we brought it at uh, increased the value of the property by over 325,000 just by changing toilets wow so, that's so awesome things, yeah, and we haven't even done anything with rent. So if you take that and you look at it, well, this didn't affect the tenants at all. The, you know, we came in there, just changed our toilets, and now our property's worth a lot more without having to go in there and, and fear tenants with this rent bump. So once we start doing all these, start doing all these improvements and show that, that now it gives us a story to say to the tenants, um, you know, Mrs., Mr. and Mrs. Tenant, um, you know, going forward for our next lease, we're going to have to be increasing rents due to these number of factors. We're improving the property and make this a better place to live. And generally, we're so under market on a lot of these properties. We're generally going to be the best product, but still slightly under market from the competitors. Because if I have to, you know, $100, $150 rent bump and I only jump up rent, $75 or 125 hours, I'm still under market. So they're not going to be able to push to a better part, another complex and stay in the same area without having to hit another rent bump here. So it generally okay. helps us now transcend where we'll have good occupancy tenants that are happy to be there because they see things performing well. Mm -hmm. And now our income levels will definitely increase based on being able to in improve on the income and the expenses. That's awesome. That's awesome. And also like about exterior improvements, uh, Jason, like uh, what about like parking lots, la landscaping, you did anything with the leasing center or was there any gym or anything on site uh, you touched upon there? Um, so only one has had a gym that's having a makeover. The other ones have a uh, leasing offices that, that are smaller components to the property, but we'll always do the heavies. If we have to do windows or roofs or parking lots, uh, mm -hmm. and then landscaping, definitely on the landscaping that usually is the first curb appeal right there. And that's part mm -hmm. of it, cleaning up the curb appeal, cleaning up the signage, cleaning up the parking lots. Those are the people that, you know, you can think of anything. You're driving up to a house or an apartment complex. If it's in disarray from outside, well, it's probably going to be in disarray inside. So we always focus sure. outside in because if you're looking at it from that perspective, it's going to help your renter pool because someone who shows up and says, well, this just looks like it's really poor. So that's probably going to tend to the management too. If they don't care about the outside, why are they going to care about the inside? I agree with you there. I agree with you. Now, now, moving on to your other deals, Jason, like how did they come about? Like, was that uh, after some uh, months or was that more or less uh, back to back uh, and things? Could you maybe give us an overview of how those things came about? 
No, they haven't been back to back. Um, generally, it's about six to eight months in between. Mm -hmm. uh, just continuing to build our network and build our network of just anybody who's boots in the ground and, and continue to build our broker network. And that's allowed us to have a number of different angles that they've come through. I mean, the, the deal that we're going to be closing on in a month is a probate deal. Uh, just that we had a relationship uh, in the city that knew we buy these type of apartment buildings, knew of this uh, probate opportunity, and it brought the deal to us. And now we're able to just transact on this opportunity where uh, it's something that they want to move on the property. But since their financials were limited, they didn't know how to turn and how to get this done. I see. Uh, now, uh, about asset management, Jason, like, how do you go about managing the asset? Like, what type of uh, controls uh, you have in place? Like, how do you monitor your leasing activity, your phone calls, and your sort of your checkpoints with your property manager and things like that? Uh, could you give us an overview of like, what sort of uh, tools and practices you have in place around that? Sure. Yeah, we have a lot of metrics we'll check at, and, and especially in the beginning phase when you're doing the heavy construction because you have a lot of points coming up. You're trying to do your lease ups, why trying to do your turn on units, why trying to do all your construction, whether it be your elected rehabs or your uh, or your lender repairs, right? So mm -hmm. you have to have a balance where you have checking in with construction department, check, checking with leasing department, checking in with the overall property management. Um, we'll, we have a set in Thursday calls that we go in through all of our properties and and talk across the board on all the properties. That's mm -hmm. always every Thursday, we'll go through that. And in between, depending on the amount of levels, we'll have reports sent to us Wednesday night, they'll be on all leasing activity and then we'll have uh, Friday day checkups, um, which basically send us reports of all the construction done with that week and plan progress for the following week. So that really helps us give a good idea of where we're at and then we'll go depending on if it's stabilized or not, or, or in repair mode uh, or repositioning mode, we'll be out into the market every two, three months. I see. And now um, I know like, for example, you are in New Jersey, properties are in Louisville and other states. Like, do you typically like uh, have monthly visits or do you have a local partner uh, that uh, uh, on site keeps tabs on some of these things? How, give us an uh, overview of how you go about that. Uh, so we will have people pass by the property, but generally our visits will be every two, three months. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. I see. And um, you basically are trusting the property manager each, uh, each step of the way, of course, uh, uh, through your checkpoints and stuff, you're always, you know, looking at the activity, but it's, it's more so, uh, you know, based on what you went last and now what has transpired that, that is that, does that sound about right? Yeah, trust but verify, right? We're getting a lot of a lot of reports across the board. There's a lot of sure. different things that are moving items that we're getting there. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of information we have to go from but that it's not a blind action because everything that's across our desk, we're allowed to see it. And if something's not making sense or being implemented correctly or just actually just not working, we have the opportunity to discuss with the property manage, management company and pivot accordingly. Right, right. Awesome, awesome. And uh, now speaking of this, uh, raising capital and things like that. How how have you gone about that? Like, uh, are you maybe hosting your meetups, your podcast? Uh, by the way, uh, I should let viewers know that uh, Jason, along with his wife, uh, Pili, has an awesome podcast that I have enjoyed myself. The podcast is called Real Estate Investing Foundations Podcast, uh, which I know for years you have awesome guests that I have personally enjoyed myself. So give us an overview of how these different platforms uh, helped us, uh, uh, you know, throughout your multifamily uh, syndications and things like that. Yeah, it goes to the point of just talking about what we're doing, right? And that goes that the platforms give you more space to get it out there. And it wasn't when we started the meetup and also the podcast, it wasn't, our focus wasn't raising money. So it was, it, it just became a component that actually spawned from it is that, you know, talking about it and just talking about what we're doing, it just opened up this opportunity for a lot more people to hear about. And so a lot more people are definitely interested and curious about the raising money factor. So from there, we'll go and really continue to just talk about it and talk about different meetups and talk with different people as we're going along the process and that's helped us to really just grow our investor pool to a pretty good level. I, I agree with you. And, and as you also must have experienced, Jason, is that there are so many uh, you know, busy professionals that they are interested, they want, they love to uh, you know, do real estate, but sometimes it's uh, for practical reasons, it's difficult. Yeah. So for, here the syndicators like you and I come in wherein we will offer them these concrete returns supported by real tangible uh, assets like apartments and give them a solid return. So it's a comprehensively a win-win uh, strategy. Would you agree? 
I would. People always say, well, why would the doctor just invest with me? Well, the doctor is working 24 hour shifts and has no time to look for deals and has all this tax hits he's hitting and has all this money they'd love or her that they'd love to put to work. Um, I actually just had a gentleman, Tony, same thing. That's his position. He's literally a doctor, came to our meetup, we're talking after. He's like, I want to put my money to work and I, I can't do this myself. I have no time. So I'd like to talk to you about your investment. Sure, I'm happy to because I, I, I have that time to work towards the deals and now be able to partner and bring other investors to it. We're able to pour resources and buy larger assets. So it makes sense for everybody. I agree I completely. Um, now, uh, the state of economy, uh, Jason, like we know the interest rates are historically low. Uh, with the amount of economic boom that we had, we know multifamily is such a darling uh, asset class that the prices have gone up. Uh, obviously, the cap rates have shrunk and things like that. What is your take on where we are uh, with the state of things? Like, are you aggressively buying patient or just kind of waiting on the sidelines to see how things go? Could you give us uh, a pointers on what your, what your thoughts are about where we are at? I'm aggressively patient, right? So I'm still looking for deals, but I'm not, I'm not buying deals on prospectus, right? I'm not buying deals that there's some future in line. We're buying deals that cash flow today. We're putting a long-term debt on them so I can ride out any wave that may happen in the next four or five years because we were supposed to be in a recession two years ago, whether in recession this year or next year, who knows? Uh, there's a lot of numbers that trend for multifamily that show that the need for basically blue collar workforce housing is gonna continue and we're not gonna be able to meet that. So there's a lot of reasons why multifamily continue, continue to be the strongest sector as it has been. Uh, but the numbers and the cap rate compression, that's not gonna to continue to go and interest rates are not going to continue to be as low as this. So we wanna prepare that you know, if I'm buying at a six cap today, well, that may be where the market trends, but ultimately cap rates are so low that five, six, seven years from now, the, the six cap is actually an eight cap because that's really where the market should be. And so I have to prepare that if I'm going to exit at that time, I have to prepare to, to be selling at a, at, at, at a lower cap rate compared to what we've seen today. I, I totally agree with you. Yeah. Right, right. I, I agree with you there. And, and with that actually comes a related question, uh, Jason, is that, how do we you know, analyze our deals? What sort of sensitivity analysis or different stress uh, levels that you go through? Could you maybe describe us as to you know, how you go about uh, doing some of uh, your stress uh, testing on these deals? Yeah, so when you're looking at these deals, a lot of times the, the proponent is that, okay, sure, you do have some rent pumps, but that you're not gonna really capture that or even rubs in year one. You're not gonna be able to, maybe you have yeah. leases and other points. So you have to be careful that, to note how long it's gonna take for this and what these rent pumps are gonna look like if you're going to be turning over leases and how you wanna play that in. So we're looking at that from an economic standpoint, from an economic vacancy standpoint, and also from a lost lease standpoint. And lastly, we're going to be looking at what it's going to take from a, a level of vacancy. What, what would this stress level look like if I was, uh, you know, I'm traditionally 85, 90% vacant. If, if for whatever reason I go down to 65%, can I sustain based on what's happening with this property? Where does that level fall in? Um, beyond that, I'm going to be looking at my return structure. Um, you know, IRR can be, can be arbitrary based on where you're going to sell, but it's a good component because a lot of investors like to talk that way. But we do want to see that we're going to meet a cash and cash component throughout the property where ideally we'll be making 50% of returns from the cash and cash flow from the years uh, and 50% of the return based on the sale. I see. I see. Got it. Now, uh, Jason, speaking of, uh, you know, you have had a long successful career. Uh, could you maybe give us an overview on like who, who has, like what are the best people who have helped you or what are the best advices that have been like aha moments for you throughout your career? Well, you continue to have aha moments, right? And so you continue <laughs> to have people around you that, that you, you look for for mentors. And uh, I, I've, I've had a number of a long way in different different components. Um, I, 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 it's actually, um, I have a friend who uh, passed away um, when he was 13, his fa but his father and I have remained friends. And uh, he's been very instrumental and in, in lots of part of my life, just helping me uh, just understand where, where the strength lies, just one in family and in business and where the focus needs to be. Um, and that's been very important because just like anything, nothing, nothing goes perfect. And just understand what's really of, of magnitude and what really is just the focus of your life helps you stay grounded. So that's been very very important to us from a, 
a multifamily standpoint, there's been great people out there that, that are doing great things. Uh, Joe Fair, this one that's got you know great podcasts, great friends. He's done a ton, been very helpful to help us like, accelerate in the process. Um, there's just so many different great platforms like your podcast where people can go and just listen to other people and how they've excelled without really having to go out there and, you know, before you could buy a book or you'd have to, you know, put on some mentorship program. Now you can learn so much before really diving in just to make sure that this is the, even the right path for you, right? Just because it sounds good. Well, maybe it's not for you. And that's right. like many par parts of business. That's awesome. That's, and, and I completely echo your sentiment where I think we are in that information age where I think access to knowledge and hence access to people and the best practices and things like that, what they are doing. And one of the greatest benefits also is that through podcasts like this and your podcast, we, we are fortunate that you can fire up your laptop or your mobile phone and hear these great guests, what they are doing. Everybody is so awesome to share what they do. Uh, and I think through these uh, all these knowledge, basically, you are astounded by the fact that such high levels of people are so humble. They are so connected to what work they do. And it's, it's basically, it's extremely inspiring to see that people at such a high uh, power that they play, they, how connected they are to their work and the best practices that they adopt. I think it in, inspires you to that next level to do more. So I, I couldn't agree with you more with what exactly you said. So yep. thank you. Uh, it's been a pleasure, uh, Jason. Uh, please share with our viewers how uh, you know how they can find you and connect with you. Sure. Thanks so much for having me on. You can go to our website, yarusiholdings.com, uh, Y-A-R-U-S-I holdings.com. Uh, you can find our email there. You can also uh, find out about our podcast and more about what we're doing. Um, yeah, love to connect with your listeners. Awesome. Awesome. And same here. I am Sakar Kaulip. Uh, all the uh, guests and viewers of the show can uh, connect with uh, at premiumcashflow.com. We are regularly uh, having a knowledgeable articles, statistics on various uh, aspects of things, whether it's multifamily, um, you know, storage and things like that. There are a lot of uh, sectors where there can be profitable returns. So uh, head on to premium cash flow. Uh, website and we have YouTube and all other social uh, channels where you can be found. So it's been a pleasure, Jason. Uh, thank you for your time. And I'll look forward to connecting with you on some other topic uh, uh, in, in a short while. So thanks for your time today. Thank you. Thanks for listening to premium cash flow real estate investing podcast. Please join us at premiumcashflow.com to sign up for weekly updates research articles, and more. We will see you again for another great interview with an expert guest.